Hello, everyone. Kind of watching the uh, waiting room and seeing more from all the people coming in. Uh, my name is Chris Leininger, and I want to thank you guys for coming out this after uh, this afternoon. Um, I uh, this is my first write at write uh, program, so bear with me. But I wanted to um, just briefly. Uh, thank you guys for all coming out. Uh, the Write at Write series, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, it is sponsored by the Write Library Foundation, and it does support the local writers uh, and people who want to write in the in the area. And all levels of experience are welcomed. We have different genres, different speakers, and uh, this is a great way for everybody to make connections. Uh, in the uh, the area with with fellow writers. Uh, just to let you know, um, this is the last one that's scheduled for 2022. We do have two that's in 2023 already. We have Writing Tough Topics for Teens, which is um, February 25th, 2023, which is kind of hard to believe. And um, that is with the Edgar Award author, winning author, Mindy McGinnis. And that will be a Friday night from 7 to 8.30. And then in March, on Sunday, March 5th, from 2 to 3.30, we'll have uh, self-publishing with C.D. Tavenor. Tavenor? Tavenor? I'm not sure if I'm saying that. He is a director of editorial services with the Two Doctors Media Collaborative. And he's also a senior copy editor with Overhaul My, My Novel. So that sounds pretty neat. So uh, with... With all that, I'm, I'm done talking and I'm gonna turn it over to Lucas Zellers and he's gonna introduce himself and we are going to learn how to build a thriving creative life. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, <laughs> just hearing the list, I've, I've come to a couple of these before and hearing the, seeing the, the authors that I've, that I've already seen on this series and hearing the names of the people who are coming up, it, uh, it really has reminded me that I am indeed in great company. So I hope to deliver uh, on the level that uh, that company demands today. Um, what I want to talk to you today about is no less than the story of the last 10 years of my life. Uh, and it is, um, it is what I, it's what I call creativity as an ecosystem. So let me show you a little bit about what I mean uh, and tell you a little bit about me. There I am. <laughs> So first of all, I want to open with uh, <laughs> I want to open with kind of my kind of my big splashy statement for today. I uh, in my day job, I am a public speaking professor, or I, I teach fundamentals of speech at the college level. And one of the things I tell my students often is to begin with a big splashy claim and get people's attention. So mine is that I don't want you to follow your dreams. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I, I certainly haven't. Uh, I've, I've been sort of led around by them kicking and screaming over the last 10 years or so. Um, but I think that what I have learned through that experience is that a far better way of approaching creativity is, as it, as it were, uh, a garden, an ecosystem, something that you cultivate. <laughs> Um, so let's begin. This is who I am. Uh, let me just load in the rest of the PowerPoint so I don't have to constantly be um, <laughs> so I don't have to constantly be down here <laughs> blocking some corners. But if you'd like to know a little bit about me, I like to show people what's going on in 
uh, about me in terms of my work. So this is uh, this is kind of what I do. Um, in about 2014, I started a blog called The Spare Room Project, where I first meaningfully explored what it meant to be uh, a creator or a successful creative person. Um, and that was that was what happened when I moved into, I got married and I moved into a two-bedroom apartment. And the wonderful thing about being married in a two-bedroom apartment is that you have a spare bedroom. And the question immediately came to mind, well, what am I going to do with this thing? A whole, I, you know, I just come out of college uh, and then slumming it with <laughs> a bunch of roommates for a few years. And it uh, it finally occurred to me that, hey, we have I have all of this space. I have square footage. Um, what a, what a fantastic opportunity for this uh, for me and all of the things that I want to do. Um, up until that point, I'd been what I call what I consider sort of a serial creative. Um, I'm intensely curious as a person have been since I was a kid, and I had a lot of time on my hands. Uh, at that time, and I used it to explore a lot of things. Um, I began as a musician, and I moved onward through um, through writing and uh, acting and uh, journalism and radio production and a whole bunch of things. And up to that point, and I really didn't have the heart to leave any of them behind. So here I am with my spare bedroom uh, and my dream. And um, I wanted to kind of begin to document the process of, of how to be a successful creative person, given the limitations that I had. So that's how the Spare Room Project began. And it has grown since then into an online platform called Scintilla Studio, which is for the projects that I am doing at the moment. Things like uh, the Book of Extinction, which is up and to my, uh, just above my head there. Um, that is uh, things like my podcast, Making a Monster, directly behind me, which I started in 2020. Um, and, uh, you know, so the Book of Extinction is also over there on the side. Who I am, basically, is a narrative designer. And that is a deliberately broad term to kind of catch a lot of the things that my professional experience has given me. I've been a, uh, basically every way that you can use your voice for fun or profit, I have done. Um, I've been, I'm currently working as, uh, as a professor of public speaking, and I'm working on uh, the project, the podcast, Making a Monster, which interviews game designers about how and why they create the villains or the monstrosities and the antagonists in their games. And I'm creating a book uh, called Book of Extinction, which is, which is a bestiary of extinct species resurrected for fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, telling conservation stories in a way they haven't really been told before, but in a way that is so perfect for the art and uh, way of storytelling that Dungeons and Dragons represents. It occurs to me that creativity is in fact an ecosystem rather than, uh, rather than a goal. Um, I, as my main work here with the Book of Extinction has put me where, has put me in this place where I have discovered the overlap between fantasy and science fiction. And I really would like there to be a world in which uh, natural history is better represented uh, or better cared for. And that begins, I think, first with um, showing people how, to, how this has an impact on their lives. Um, Coming as I do from the rural Midwest, we I, I lived more closely with nature than most, I think. Um, I remember walking out of my house and up and down the rows of cornfields, both for pleasure and for profit as a child. Um, my favorite place in the world is a, uh, is a little nature preserve in a town called Franklin Grove, Illinois. Um, and that was just how I... Uh, Enjoy, that was just the the way of life that I enjoyed. That was my experience of the world. Um, and so when it came time to, to start to think very seriously about how in the world I was going to succeed as a creative person and as a creative professional, the uh, the metaphor that came, that I used naturally was uh, was that of an ecosystem. And I think that my experience over the past 10 years that I'm going to walk you through has shown you that that is perhaps the most helpful way of thinking about how to succeed creatively. 
Uh, that model has four parts. And they are as follows. First, you got to build a habitat in the same way that an animal does. You have to keep out poachers. You have to protect that habitat and keep it safe. You have to push the snowball or uh, make incremental progress over time. And you have to recycle. Um, projects end, and they should. And that, I don't think, uh, is a bad thing. It's part of this sort of cycle of how things work. Uh, and I want you to be able to make the most of it. So. Before we get into what I think this what I think this looks like, I want to do a couple of things for you, and I'd like to direct your attention to the chat window if I can, um, and ask just if you wouldn't mind dropping in there. What are some of the things that you like to make, or rather, uh, or or even what are some of the reasons that you came to this particular opportunity today, and we're hoping to hoping to improve your experience. Just kind of trying to get a sense of what it is that your uh, that your unique curiosities have led you to explore, um, and kind of be able to <laughs> kind of be able to tailor my examples accordingly, because it would be very easy uh, looking at a talk called "Oh, hello, someone's joining me." Uh, <laughs> someone's joining me on the screen here. Oh, good. We've got music, music makers, podcasters, um, writers of screenplays, arts and crafts, which I love as a phrase, by the way, arts and crafts, just a thing that we <laughs> just sort of this broad catch all bin for um, all of the all of the things that we could possibly do uh, with little bits and bobs. How to be my best creative self. Uh, thanks, Sasha. I'm glad you're asking. Sarah says, I'm a writer who can never finish an entire story. Frankly, I feel you. Um, personal essays, beaded jewelry. Uh, I'm wearing beaded jewelry, actually. Um, I'm my uh my wife was my wife did that for a very long time and we made this together. Art and business consulting. Excellent. That's a great combination. I'm glad, I'm glad you're here because this has a lot of overlap, I think, with the personal and the, the business and the artistic. And we're going to talk a bit about um, what those what those make. Wow, you guys are <laughs> you guys have broad interests. A wonderful crafternoon when you can use your hands to make stuff. I wholeheartedly agree. Graphic design, um, how to not need inspiration to still create. Uh, that's an excellent question, and I think I can answer that one as well, Natalie. Um, so let's let's get into it. Before, uh, before we start, I want to share something with you. Um, because there are so many different interests represented here, and because this, this way of thinking about them can be uh, so broadly applicable, I wanted to put something in your hands that would let you uh, be able to work with this uh, on your own. So I'm going to drop a link in the chat. Um, and this is to a, a form fillable PDF that I put together. It should look something like this. Uh, so you can follow along. There's a few questions that I want you to ask of yourself as we go through each step of this process, building a habitat, keeping out poachers, pushing the snowball, and recycling. Um, and this will uh, this will be a great way just to keep your notes in uh, in place as we go, and a few particular questions that are going to make this very personal to you and the very, very different things that you are all doing. So I hope that's working for everybody. Let me know if you have trouble downloading it, and we'll troubleshoot that as we go. Uh, but I want to I want to start uh, in with the first step of this process. So if you've got that PDF open, that's page one. Uh, building a habitat is uh, 
habitat in my usage defines, and this is really kind of the biggest thing that I can give you today, um, your creative goal needs exactly the same thing from the situation that you build for it that uh, a creature or an animal needs from the habitat in which it lives. Food, water, shelter. Um, and what do those things mean? So let me break it down a little bit. First of all, I want to ask, I want to suggest that you choose a single creative goal. And by this, I don't mean um, the the only creative goal, because if, if anybody is uh, if anybody is here to sympathize with those who have too many things that they love, I'm here for you. Uh, and I don't really, um, I don't really want to limit you. But what I do want to do is tell you that is tell you to do one thing at a time. Um, your this single creative goal is going to be what we're working with. This is going to be the species of the talk today. This is going to be the the thing that we are considering and the habitat that we got to build around it. So I want to talk a little bit about how to choose because um, I do think it's important to choose just one, at least for a time. So here's what it looks like. Some of the best advice I've been given on this subject is that when someone asks you to do something, and you see this in quite a lot of business and entrepreneurship books, um, if someone asks you to do something, and the answer in your mind is uh, not, if it's, if it's a yes, but if it's not a hell yes, then it's a no. Um, and I want to be careful about how I say that, but I do think that, or, or how you use that, but I do think that it definitely applies in terms of choosing which single creative goal to pursue. You want to find the one that is that gets from you an immediate and enthusiastic response, regardless of other circumstances, like the thing that really moves your heart. Um, if you're looking at that doc and it asks you the question, um, to list a few of your creative goals that you might consider, um, maybe think of the one that you wrote first or the one that immediately sprang to mind or the one that you wrote a little bit bigger. Um, you'll, uh, now that you've got that in mind, ask yourself this question. If you had to put twice the effort into this thing that you thought you might and only could get half the reward out of it, would you still do it? I think there's a lot of reasons to answer yes to this question. Um, <clears throat> in my case, uh, Book of Extinction was, is, I, I started Book of Extinction in January 2021, and I had hoped to bring it to Kickstarter in October of last year. And the life cycle on that is we're hoping to bring it to Kickstarter for to begin its publication in March of 2023. And I'm still doing it because I would do that if it took twice as long and I got half as much out of it. So just a, just a good way to think about, like, what's the one thing you want to pursue? Um, this doesn't have to be your goal for life. In making this choice, this is, this is more for like, uh, this is more for this exercise, but I want you to consider what you could expect to accomplish reasonably over the next 90 days or a year. Your choice, um, I've seen both of those time spans used pretty well in this context, but um, in, my, in my personal life, we tend to reevaluate things once a quarter. Uh, things change, you know, accidents happen, uh, different, you know, finances change, a whole bunch of things. So I tend to break my year into 90-day chunks and then consider what I'm going to accomplish in each of those, which is also a great way to narrow down your creative goals. So you have so many things that you want to do and so many things that you feel that you can give the world and so much that you enjoy. So how do you decide which one to pursue? Um, it's easier to say, not yet than it is to say no. So think about either the next 90 days, which is what I would recommend, or a year if you wanna think about it that way for larger term projects, but think about 90 days and think about one thing that you would wanna bend your entire energy toward over the span of that time. When you do it, I wanna encourage you to stay on the bus. Um, this is a metaphor that comes to us, uh, it's called the Helsinki bus station metaphor. Um, or, or it's sort of a thought experiment that um, in a, at a particular bus station in Helsinki, this was an address given 
uh, in 2006, that there were all of these buses leaving the bus station and you could get on one of them uh, and then you might end up getting off and then coming back to the bus station and trying to get somewhere else on a different bus. And you would have driven over the course of that, over the course of your time on so many different buses and you'd driven the same amount of miles, but you're still at the bus station. So some of the best advice uh, that, I've, that I've heard creatively is to run after something hard. And I think a part of that is setting the time and maybe, it, maybe it's a little longer. Um, one of my favorite YouTube uh, art, one of my favorite artists on YouTube is a guy who goes by the name of Struthless. Um, one of his art teachers gave him the advice to draw the same thing for an entire year. Uh, this guy is Australian, and they have uh, they have a breed of ibis down, or rather, a species of ibis down there that they call the bin chicken. And it's uh, it's kind of a trash bird. And he's like, I, I get that. I vibe with that aesthetic. So his goal was to draw an ibis every day for a year. Um, after a couple of weeks, you get pretty sick of it. But by the end of the year, you get really good at drawing ibises. <laughs> so um, what I want to do is give you a goal that you can pursue long enough that it uh, that you move past unorigin that you move past unoriginality and find something original to you on the other side of it. It takes time, probably a little more time than you think, and I want you to push past it through the end. Um, anything that doesn't make this cut, we're going to talk about putting that in a parking lot. Sort of not yet. The sort of part of the bus station that uh, that we're not gonna we're not gonna get back to. I, I find it very difficult to say no. I find it very easy to say not yet. So if you're if you're looking at that doc, your your next your your first step here, I think, is to list your goals and highlight the one you thought of first, or the one that you pursue when you have when given the choice, or the one that you desire the most, or the one that moves your heart, and think about how you're going to work with that over the next ninety days, at least. Now that you've got a goal, I want to talk about it in terms of the creative process, because I want you to fully understand what species you're, uh, you're encountering here. Um, I could have called this talk a field guide. I dearly love field guides, uh, because mostly they're just, despite the fact that they are meant to help you recognize, uh, let's say, birds in the wild and sort of help you, you know, broadly become a better person, and they tend to contain very dry information like size and habitat and feeding habits and things like that. Uh, they are, at the core of them, just books filled with pictures of beautiful animals, and I absolutely love that. So I could have called this talk the field guide to a creative ecosystem, and I desperately would have wanted to. Um, but at, seeing as we're talking more about the ecosystem than the species, <laughs> I decided to move it that way. Um, but I want you to kind of understand what each species is. So what are the, if we're talking about a woodpecker, which woodpecker are we talking about? What are the markings of it? And the best way I think to understand this is the, really the first model, uh, the first complete model that was proposed of the creative process as a whole. Now, it might seem at this point the, a bit megalomanic to uh to think that I could describe the entire creative process. But this definition came out in 1926. It was extremely ambitious. Um, it comes from the work, uh, The Art of Thought by social psychologist Graham Wallace. And I have found it to be true in the way that I work. And I've worked in, in a couple, almost every project that I work on, despite how different they are, conform to this four-step process pretty exactly. Um, so I wanna show you this for, uh, I want to show you what this is. I want to show you how it works for me. So you can kind of think about how this might work for you. By getting a handle on this scope, by being able to name and describe your creative goal as a species, um, I think you will uh, demystify it a bit and be able to understand it and work with it better. So here we go. There's four steps. They are preparation, uh, illumina incubation, illumination, and refinement. I'll leave those up for a second. Broadly speaking, preparation is the step where you, you aren't actually making anything yet. This is input. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of writing a public speech, this is gathering content or thinking of an idea. Um, 
It could also be just the part of your life where you read deeply about the thing that you love. You soak yourself in it. You try new things and you just uh, sort of walk around and find other people who are interested in it. If you are familiar with role-playing games at all, uh, you might have heard of the Call of Cthulhu RPG. Uh, and if you're not familiar with role-playing games, you probably have heard the name Cthulhu somewhere in the cultural mythos. It refers to the, the, uh, the body of works that were created by H.P. Lovecraft starting in the uh, tw 1920s. Um, and it, it was a very particular genre. It was almost as... Uh, it was almost as new and exciting as science fiction was when it arose, uh, even though it took a while to catch on. Um, most role-playing games has as their, have as their goal to distill a certain genre of literature and give people a way to play in that space and use those genre expectations. And there was a time before the cultural transcendence of Dungeons & Dragons where there wasn't really a, a role-playing game for everything the way there is now. And Call of Cthulhu was one of the earliest to be added to that pantheon. Its creator was a guy by the name of Sandy Peterson. And part of how he got that job was by being very, very obnoxious about being the Lovecraft guy. The way he tells the story on uh, a recent episode of the Dice Geeks podcast is that he, uh, everyone he knew who knew about H.P. Lovecraft in, I think, the early 80s he was talking about, uh, knew about it because of him. And he had just spent years of his childhood reading Lovecraft stories, and uh, even when they were still very difficult to find. So preparation is about soaking in your idea. Um, you know, what, who, are, who are the people that you, that you, whose work you love to consume? Who are the people that you love to watch and listen to? What's the music that you like? Just get into it deep and fill yourself with it. Incubation is the step where this moves from conscious mind to subconscious thought. So you've got it, you know what kind of thing you want to make, you know what moves your heart, and you have decided how to do it, how to move forward. Um, you've, you've chosen a creative goal or a particular project um, or a particular piece of this kind of art. Um, it takes time for an idea to become fully formed. In I know in my case, uh, usually I will get up about two in the afternoon um, it, that is on the days when I have it to myself to write in the way that I like. I usually stop about halfway through and I go wash the dishes or I go cut the grass or whatever I got to do. Something with my hands to move this idea from like active front of the brain thought to back of the mind where my subconscious is sort of figuring this out. Even better if you can sleep on it, at least for 24 hours. Um, ideas are better when they've had time to cook. Illumination in this context, uh, the third step, is when you start to see the puzzle pieces fit together. You find answers to questions. You think, oh, well, this is how I can set up the lathe to get the, the machining pass that I want. Excuse me. You start to see solutions. This is how I can do this, or this is the, this is the thing that I need to run at. If I do it this way, it will turn out like this. Um, and you start to have new ideas. And this is where it really starts to come together. Refinement is the last step, and this is tweaking the details, polishing your structure, and refining the process. So if you, um, I've seen a lot of people paint the same picture over and over again. I think there's wisdom in that. Um, but the more you do that, the better off your that picture is going to be. It's about changing the fine details. Uh, sculptors work the same way as well. You hog off big pieces of marble, and then now you're down to sanders and polishing wheels and things like that. Um, this is true of almost every creative uh, creative endeavor. There's a point at which it's just no core part of this is changing. It looks basically the same now as it will when you're done. It just looks better when we're finished with the refinement step. So that's that's the four steps of the creative process from beginning to end. Preparation, incubation, illumination, and refinement. And if you can see how this works in your life, then I think it will be much easier for you to make decisions about how to start and when to start and what to start and how much time to prepare for and how much time to leave. The other thing that I should tell you about this is that this isn't an even split. These, this, these aren't quartiles. They don't, uh, they don't go, these aren't clean 25% breaks in how you tend to do art. Sometimes the preparation phase takes forever. Sometimes something gets stuck in editing and you just have to go over and over and over it to get the story that you like. And that's okay. 
um, that's a that's a part of how this works. Uh, so if you <laughs> so if you're thinking about your 90 days uh, and you've got 12 weeks and you leave three weeks for each of these, that might be a little bit rigid. Um, give yourself some grace in that regard. So your application, well, let me let me take you briefly through how this kind of works for me. What I tend to do, or, or what I'm doing to create the Book of Extinction is over and over again, the process of writing about 1,200 words on a species that is no longer extant on this planet, animals that have gone extinct within living memory. They can be heartbreaking to read, they can be tragic, but I think they're really important to think about. And the first part of this, back when I started it really seriously in June, was to get every book I could find and read, if not all of them, then the relevant chunks. And I sped read a lot. I skimmed a lot. I read the sixth extinction cover to cover at least twice. I've read End of the Megafauna twice. Um, but this, this for me was all part of the preparation phase, was figuring out what are the stories that I want to tell or, or, and how to understand this process, not just as a lay person, but as someone who's familiar with some of the, some of the pitfalls that can happen at, at the beginning of your journey into this. I'll tell you, <clears throat> that the uh, Ohio's libraries have a huge advantage in this regard. If you haven't heard of the Ohio Link service, uh, you should. Any book, any library in the state of Ohio will send you any book and will send any book in their collection to any other library in the state of Ohio for the asking. This is not true of any other state in the in the Union, and it's flat incredible. I've gotten so many books from Kent State. I feel like I need to go up there and give somebody a hug at this point. It's only fair. Um, but uh, so you have an incredible library system at your, oh, you have TechShare. Glad to hear Texas has something similar. Um, you have an incredible library system at your fingertips here in Ohio. And I encourage you to take full advantage of it. Everyone's happy when you do. Uh, and it can lead to great results. So once I've, now that I've kind of read some of these stories, extinction broadly and in individual species one at a time, I start to get a sense of uh, how this works. So this is the Perennian Ibex. Um, this is perhaps the only animal to have ever gone extinct twice. Um, the last individual member of the species, or she was called Celia, was found dead in 1999 and uh, that was about a year after um, a team of researchers had taken a tissue sample from her left ear. Uh, and then they, uh, they did the work of, of cloning Celia. There, there was a second Celia. Hundreds, after hundreds and hundreds of attempts, uh, one live birth was achieved from a surrogate mother of a similar species. And that Ibex lived for only a few minutes before passing away from breathing difficulties uh, due to malformed lungs. Um, Heather has a great question. I'll take time, I'll take time to, to pause on this. Where do you find time to work on this? Um, and if you've got 90 days to do all of this thing, um, I will admit that I have I am privileged in that I have I am able to construct my life such that I can work on things for a full work day at a time. I know that's not the case for everyone. Uh, and it wouldn't be, and certainly I don't want art and creativity to only be the province of the people who have that privilege. So part of what I wanna show you today is how to make those decisions and how to make the most of the time that you have. So certainly hear me, I'm not saying that you have to have the situation that I have in order to be successful in the way that I think that I am. Um, I think these principles apply to any situation in life and any creative goal, and I hope to show you how that works. So, so stick with me. Um, for me, the, the second part of the creative process, incubation, involves reading those stories and then telling them to other people. <clears throat> my friends and my dear wife have heard me tell enough maudlin extinction stories that they really deserve to be able to do to me anything at this point. I would not under, I, I truly understand why people want me to stop talking about this. But for me, this is an important part of the process. I'm trying to figure out what is the story at the bottom here? What's the particular nugget, the thing that I wanna tell? And in retelling this story, it becomes easier to figure that out. Um, so for me, incubating the story means um, telling it to other people. 
For me, the solution to this particular problem came when I made a very particular connection. Dungeons and Dragons has two monsters at the top tier of its games, um, two enemies that are going to be the big bad boss of your entire gaming experience. It's either a dragon or a lich, an undead wizard. And to me, uh, a cloned sheep from a particular tissue sample, that's a lich. D&D already has a word for what the Perennian Ibex is, and it was really only a matter of putting them together. That's what Illumination did for me, is that moment when it all kind of clicked. Um, and I've, I've got, I I've was able to get a couple of in-progress sketches from our artist on this project. And you can kind of see the exact same process happening again for him. Um, so we started with a sketch at the top left and it turned into line art. And then we added flats and we went through a couple of different things and figured it out before finally um, it got to the refinement stage where we've got, um, you know, shading and oil paints and purple lighting effects and uh, wiggles and all of this. It's absolutely incredible. Um, for me, that fourth step of refinement involves taking that story and taking what we've written and doing some really heavy editing to it and then to, to be able to lay it out on a page. Um, that's not true of everybody. That's just the thing that I'm making right now. Turns out making books is really hard. And there's a lot more that goes into it than I certainly thought uh, as, a, as a writer when I began this project. But these, I think, are the four stages of creativity. Um, no matter how you're, no matter what you're doing, um, it, it's all, it's all going to go through these four stages. And I think, especially if you are having to get time in bits and pieces relative to other priorities, then I think it might be helpful for you to know that you've got to do four things and you generally have to do them in this order. Uh, so you can start to plan like, okay, um, I got to figure out, I got to spend some time soaking this in, I, in this idea first. So if I am not actively writing or drawing in this tiny stretch of time between when the kids go to bed and when the kids wake up, that's okay, because you're in the first stage. Uh, and once you've got it, then you can start to move forward and you can make better decisions about how to use the time that you have. In that spirit, I want to, to let you know that uh, I want you to be able to define success for yourself. Every species has a different life proposition, is the way that ecologists tend to talk about it, things that they need and ways that they get them. And uh, I want you to... Um, I want you to be able to figure out for yourself what the life proposition of your creative goal is. Let me, let me show you a little bit. Let me define by opposite for a second here. It doesn't have to be Olympic level. <clears throat> so if you look, if, if you're a writer or if, you're, if you write screenplays and your goal is to create a, a million dollar blockbuster, I think that's fine. And I, I want you to have that audacity. But I do want you to know that like, if you just want to write screenplays, then that's also okay. Uh, what I mean by this is that I think you should look at what the top people in this field are doing and look at what it takes to get there and stay there. So who are the people whose names keep showing up on summer blockbusters as scriptwriters? What are they doing? What is that going to take? If that for you doesn't look like success, then I think that's fine. If it is, then absolutely run after it. But I want you to divorce yourself of the idea that if you can't be the absolute best, then that isn't success because there are other visions of it. Um, point of fact, talking of Olympics, this is a, a photo series called Athletes. It was done in 2002 by a photographer named Howard Schatz. All of these are athletes at the top of their field absolute pinnacle of human achievement for their sport. And they look radically different from each other. Um, I don't have space to show the rest of this because there are frankly too many Olympic sports. Um, but this, this kind of variation only continues. Um, success can be very different depending on what your goals are and what you're hoping to achieve. So um, this, I think, also lets you kind of forgive yourself for not having eight hours at a go to put into the thing that you really want to do. Um, success for you overall looks very different than it does for these people. I am never going to be a sumo wrestler. I'm never, <laughs> um, never going to be a shot put thrower because I just don't have the body type. Um, and think that's okay. You know, success for me looks, looks different. So define for yourself what success is going to be. Um, I'm going to move one level down. Uh, even if you don't want to be the top of your field, it doesn't even have to be a potential career. 
I read a piece recently in Repeller Magazine by Molly Conway. It's called, she called it The Modern Trap of Turning Hobbies into Hustles. Um, he, she quoted Adam J. Kurtz as, uh, uh, in he, he kind of rewrote that maxim that we've all heard, do what you love and you've ne you'll never work a day in your life. Uh, he considered rather that probably another way to think about it, or, or that can very easily become working super hard all the time with no separation or any boundaries and also taking everything extremely personally. Uh, <laughs> Molly's, Molly's contention was that it's okay to love a hobby in the same way you'd love a pet for its ability to enrich your life without any expectation that will help you, that it will help you pay the rent. This, I think, also takes the pressure off. <clears throat> so if you have this all or nothing mentality where uh, this has to be financially viable or I can't do it, um, maybe that's true. Uh, maybe that's the situation that you're in in life, or maybe you're just putting too high an expectation on yourself. Um, and maybe you need to figure out that, or maybe you need to consider that this is just something, this can just be what it is. I have a frequent collaborator who often tells me, you know, it's okay to just enjoy things. Because um, coming as I do from a marketing background and uh, coming as I do with, um, you know, this kind of interesting space in life where I'm kind of in a freelance part-time, I can kind of choose the things that I work on. Um, the the temptation, especially for me, is to think like, if this if this doesn't pay, pan out, I can't do it. And that's not necessarily true. Um, I think there are there are hugely fulfilling and enriching ways to live that have nothing to do with turning your turning your hobby into a hustle. Uh, again, if that's what it means for you, then define success that way and run after it. Um, but maybe it doesn't have to be that. Um, I'll also give you it doesn't even have to leave your home to be successful in in terms of uh, in terms of what I think successful creativity can be. This is my dungeon master. Uh, his name is Luke, and he has, for the last six years, been crafting an incredibly interest, intricate and emotionally compelling story that will only ever have been told to about eight people. Rebecca Reynolds uh, put it this way in an article, in a July 2022 article for The Rabbit Room. So much of artistic culture focuses on building a personal platform, getting signed with a publisher or label, and attracting fans. But the grand creative work done by most dungeon masters like Luke is offered only to six or seven people. It will never bring fame or fortune, just escape, joy, adventure, and camaraderie. And I can tell you that that campaign that he built uh, has been one of the most fulfilling story experiences I've ever been a part of. And if that isn't success, then I don't know what is. Uh, if we're talking in terms of business, and I will, uh, I will say that um, you might consider Joe Polizzi's book, Content Inc., where he differentiates between legacy businesses, which you mean to pass on to your family, and businesses that you mean to build to the point where you can sell them. Um, there might, so, you know, if, if financial success is a part of your goal, then consider whether this is something that you want to keep and own or whether this is something that you want to package for an outside investor. And having that goal in mind changes the way that you, um, that you begin to make decisions about what to do and what to do next. So at this point, uh, I think maybe the best thing that I can do is help you define for yourself what success looks like. So I want you to put bullets down in reverse chronological order. At the top of this section, write down where you would want to be if your wildest dreams came true. Like what is the top level of success that you can conceive? And then I want you to write what comes before that, do you think? What do you have to do uh, you know, to get to the million dollar Kickstarter? Uh, what do you have to do to get ready for that step? And then what do you have to do to get ready for that step? And work your way down until you get to where you are. And then figure out which of those bullets is the definition of success for you in the next 90 days. And then run at that and run at it hard. While you're thinking about that, I'll tell you that this is, this is kind of where the whole habitat thing comes together. I was surprised to learn that the idea of habitat is a fairly recent phenomenon in the science of ecology. There was a time when we thought of things in terms of the balance of nature, sort of a global uh, system that 
uh, couldn't be put out of uh, out of balance by by anything that we were capable of doing. And it took us a while. I think the the 1700s. I'm still doing the research on this. It took us a while to come to the come to the conclusion that each set of uh, each ecosystem has different demands and uh, has uh, creates or, or each each animal is uniquely matched to their their ecosystem. So beavers need wetlands. Um, orangutan orangutans need rainforests. Uh, catfish need uh, riffles. Um, it's just kind of, it's just the way that it is. And I think that every goal, every creative goal rather, similarly needs a habitat. And you can kind of think about this in terms of very specific things. It helps me to, it helps me at least to figure out what do I actually need um, and how am I going to get it or to, to get to that next step up my ladder of bullets. So first of all, for creative goals, this is space. This is true of, this is true of animals as well. Um, there have to be wetlands for the beavers to live in, and they have to occupy a certain amount of, of acreage. Uh, but in terms of creative success, I think it often requires a dedicated physical space, and preferably a permanent one. Um, this, is the, this was the whole idea of the spare room project. Like, I can put stuff in that room and leave it there and come back to it, and it will, it will help me sort of begin um, to, to move forward that way. It doesn't have to be a whole room, because again, I... I I, I must get you out of this talk knowing that I don't want creativity to be limited to the people that have these resources. A lot of content creators do this. Uh, you know, you see a lot of TikTokers recording in their car for this exact reason, because it's big enough for you and a phone and nothing else. And uh, often, you know, there's not a lot else going on in the car other than, than how to do that. My friend Allie ran a jewelry design business from a card table for a few years because that was all the space she had in her apartment. Um, I have a friend who made the decision to uh, to convert one of their bedrooms into an office, which which happened, uh, I think, due to the uh, due to the restrictions that happened in 2020. We all had to work from home for a while. Um, but it really made a difference in the way that she moved forward in her work to, to be able to put it in a space and know where it was. Um, that gives yourself a whole lot of permission to, to be able to do that. Um, by yeah, private study rooms at the libraries are excellent as well. Um, this is I this is also I think why you see a lot of why we have the cliche of the coffee shop are all excuse me, the coffee shop author. Um, it's a third place. It's not work and it's not home. It's kind of this liminal space where you can choose what to do with it. And it's all someone else will always wipe down the table. Um, you can always get a cup of coffee and have an excuse to be there for a while. Um, so space looks a lot of ways for a lot of different people in exactly the same way that space looks a lot of different ways for a lot of different species. I'll also tell you that this doesn't refer to just physical space. This recur this refers to temporal space as well. So when in your daily and weekly routine does this activity belong? Um, look at the way, look at the demands on your time and figure out where the holes are and then figure out what can you fit in there. Uh, if there's a verse, if, if your creative goal is perhaps too big to fit in that, figure out how you can split it or figure out a different place to put it. Um, but I want you to be, I want you to make decisions about when this is going to happen, because that is just as important as making a decision about where. Shelter is about protection from poachers. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's the reason that, uh, it's the reason that certain animals live in places that others don't, because that's where the predators don't go. But uh, we're going to talk about that and when we talk about keeping out of poachers. Um, I want to also tell you about food. Did you know that um, that beavers don't eat the whole tree? They just eat a particular, they just eat the thin layer between the, the dead wood and the bark. And that takes a lot of doing. Um, they have metal chisels for teeth that they peel the bark off and then pull that one soft layer of wood out. Um, artists are, or creative goals are the same way, but it, for most of them, it's it's about sourcing materials. And this can be a major consideration. Um, my friend Hannah is a glass mosaic artist and her workflow, I remember being severely interrupted when the glaze that she used to seal her work was discontinued and it took weeks to find a suitable substitute. This, this happens at a, at a time and I want you to be able to plan accordingly. There's a guy I follow on Instagram. His name is Zach Miskry. 
and he makes naturalistic animal sculptures from disassembled recycled electronics and salvaged parts. I don't think Zach is ever going to hurt for materials at the rate we're going. There's always going to be some kind of uh, some kind of electronics that he can recycle into the work that he makes. So figure out what you need to put into your uh, your creative goal in order for it to work. What's it going to take uh, at, at like a very practical level? I need pencils. I need watercolors. I need uh, I need time to write. I need a uh, I need a, a word processor that doesn't connect to the internet, whatever it is, figure out exactly what you need, be honest about it, and uh, start to plan accordingly. Um, it's at this point where that I should say that equipment shouldn't be an obstacle. The Home Depot, uh, do you remember Home Depot? There, I, I wish I could remember exactly what the ad said. Um, oh, I do. The Home Depot ran an ad that said, you're a tool guy. Come to Home Depot and get the tools that you need to do the thing. I think Home Depot has realized that buying tools is often a different hobby than using them. Uh, <laughs> this is certainly true of, of, of role-playing games as well. A lot of people who are in that hobby have stacks and stacks of books that they just, they're never going to play them because uh, it's way easier to buy the book on, on the hope that you will than, than to actually make it happen. So there's a yin and yang here where I want you to uh i want you to i don't want you to use lack of an equipment as a, as an excuse but i don't want you to hamper yourself with substandard equipment so this is kind of how you have to think about it first of all um take advantage of local maker spaces i'm going to harp on the library again there's there's a the Green County Library has a facility called the Spark Place. It's full of 3D printers and large format printers and button makers and um uh, software and hardware that are beyond the reach of the average individual creator, but you can get them and you can use them and the library is going to help you do that. If you know makers, makers or creators who are in a similar space to you, see if you can borrow tools from them. Um, I grew up in farm country and that is how we did it every year. Like, hey, you're going to have the baler this weekend. I'm going to have the baler this weekend. It was kind of just how we did things. And I love that um, because it, it helps break that, that cycle where, you know, I'm not going to not cut the field because I don't have a baler, um, but I'm also going to not try to cut the field without one. It's solving that particular problem. The question that you might have is, how do you know when you're ready to upgrade? Uh, when is it time to invest in a new tool? And I think that the easiest answer to this is when you are familiar enough with your process, when you when you reach the limits of the tools that you have now, or when you're familiar enough with your process to improve specific steps. Uh, 3D printers are a great way of looking at this. Some of them only have a certain level of resolution. So if you need a very fine detail, but your printer doesn't do it, it might be time to get a new printer. My guitar teacher, when I was a kid, called this outplaying your guitar. At some point, your hands get strong enough and dexterous enough to move faster than the action of the strings will allow. Might be time to upgrade from the $80 banger you had when you started. Uh, here's another, here's my favorite example. Uh, just before college, my brother and I were installing soffit on a shed, and we needed to clip some of the roofing nails that uh, had been used to anchor the gutter flush with the roofing so that we could get the soffit up there. It's not important exactly what that means, if that's hard to picture, but it is It is enough to know that we spend hours doing that, clipping off nails with a pair of these. And apparently these are called diagonal cutters. I didn't know that. Uh, I, I may have known that at the time, but I certainly did. <laughs> um, I certainly had forgotten. Uh, we spent hours doing it this way, and it was a pain in the neck. And then my brother said, you know what? We're done. We're going to the hardware store. We're leaving the job site. We're going to the hardware store and we are getting a pair of these. These are called end nippers, apparently. And it turns out if you need to nip the end off of something like we did, this makes it way faster. We finished the rest of the roof, the rest of the roof in 45 minutes. It was insane. And I have never forgotten that. It's been decades now. So Upgrade when you reach your tools limits or when you're familiar enough with your process to improve specific steps. Mythbuster Adam Savage wrote in his book, Every Tool is a Hammer. He said, my personal rule was that if I needed a tool more than three times within a year, it was worth investing in a good one of my own. I will say the man seems to be able, seems to have a compulsive problem with buying tools, but it's a good rule of thumb uh, to have, to figure out what, when do I need to start? When do I need to kick this over? What's the time? Uh, it was the time to move this over. Part of the other way to think about habitat is to do things like you're going to have to do it 12 more times. 
I want you to be able to set yourself up for success. Beavers have metal chisels for teeth because they have to chew wood all day. Chameleons have a complicated lever and pulley system uh, built into their tongue, like the way that their bones are shaped in their mouth. That's why their chins are so baggy, because they have to shoot their tongue at bugs over and over and over again. Your creative goal is going to have to do certain operations over and over and over again. Brush strokes, uh, words typed, um, Oh, just just any one of a whole number of things. Uh, machinists and uh, carpenters understand this well. My dad was a machinist and he taught me the value of addressing the work. Like put it in a vise, clamp it down, put it on some sawhorses, don't just saw in the air. Um, so this is, uh, this is what I think you wanna be able to do is to do things as though you're gonna do them 12 more times. My person, 12 by the way, is my rule for managing data in Excel. Like if I have to do the operation 12 times in the same spreadsheet, write a formula that does it. Um, my friend Nat knows how to code in Python and his rule is three. Like that's like he does something three times and then he starts to write something to automate it. I'm not there yet, but figure out the parts of your process that are sucking up your time and uh, see, see what you can do to, to automate them or make them easier for yourself. That's part of making a successful creative habitat. So uh, while you're thinking about this, on that, on that little sheet, itemize what the creative process for your goal requires. And realize that it may be less than you think. Um, don't let that be an obstacle to get to getting started. Step two: Now that you've built a habitat, you have to protect it. Uh, and this is where we get back to. Uh, this is where we get back to Heather's question as well, because some things have a right to your time and your space and your attention and your priorities. That's absolutely true. And other, thing, other things are trespassing. And those things are going to hunt your creativity to extinction if you let them. It's your job as a creator to know the difference and enforce it. I call this letting your yes be yes and letting your no be no. I've said yes to this thing. I'm going to, and I, I know what that means. I'm going to keep saying yes to it. I've said no to these other things. I'm going to say no to them. Uh, borrowing a, a little more heavily from the ecology metaphor, uh, you have to understand the difference between poachers and predators. Predators are actually a good thing. Um, probably the most famous example is the Yellowstone Wolf Project. In the early, 19, in the early 1900s, uh, conservationists had this idea that since fewer wolves meant more deer, no wolves would mean a hunter's paradise. So they hunted the wolves out of Yellowstone National Park. along with the removal of other car carnivores like cougars and bears, this had a profound effect on Yellowstone. In the absence of carnivores, elk numbers boomed, which resulted in significant changes in vegetation. Beavers became increasingly rare, and the whole dynamic of the food web in the park was significantly altered because of the loss of the creature at the top. It's a keystone species that altered the structure and function of the entire, uh, the entire ecosystem. So yeah, there are things that demand your time. There are other priorities than the creative goal that you have. But I want to challenge you to think of them not as, to think of them specifically as predators and not as poachers. Because if you don't know, I want, to, I want, you, to, I want you to realize that predators are just as important as producers often in the way that, we, in the way that ecosystems function. Um, Limitation is the mother of creativity often. Uh, deadlines help me finish books. It's just how it works. All of those things, yeah, there are things that I might find it easier to create without in the short run, but they do contribute to a healthy creative ecosystem. Um, so predators, yes. Um, what, think about what do you have to say yes to in order to create at your best? You have to say yes to your kids. You have to sleep sometimes. You have to take a shower, for goodness sake. Uh, you have to drink some water. Just like, what are the things that you need to say yes to in order to create at your best? And think about this in terms of long-term sustainability. Um, you know, uh, it, sure, you can say no to sleep for, for a few nights, but eventually it's going to catch up with you. That's a predator. It's part of the ecosystem. It's important to have it. Um, by contrast, poachers are, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <they're, laughs> sleep is critical. Coffee will only go so far. 
Um, poachers are no. Poachers are any, poachers are, are kind of the opposite of this. Poachers in this definition, um, rather, let me put this up. That's what we've been talking about. Poachers is anything that doesn't support your goal. In my experience, uh, this was YouTube. I was there and I was uh, I was just coming into my own, like I was in my in my mid, I was 15 when YouTube was launched. And at the time, I don't think anybody knew what uh, what a profound effect it could have on people's focus and attention. I found out uh, the hard way. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there was a time somewhere between 05 and 09 where I had watched all of YouTube, like the whole thing, all of it, because uh, back then that was possible. And uh, it took me a long time to break that habit. YouTube was a huge obstacle to me for years. More recently, mobile games have been an op have been an obstacle for me. I just have to uninstall things from my phone because I have to say no to things if or if in order to say yes to the things that I want to be able to say yes to. Weirdly, one of the poachers that I've been struggling with is other projects, like stuff that are really, really attractive projects, stuff that I want to do that isn't necessarily helpful towards the most important thing, um, which is, again, if you can't say no, say not yet. Figure out a parking lot for projects that aren't, that aren't the most important thing. And if you find something that's going to contribute to the other projects, to the other project. You're like, oh, at some point, I really want to paint this series of, of pictures. I've got this great idea for how it's going to look, but um, this is a great reference photo for that. Keep it. Yes. Find a place for it <laughs> uh, that you can come back to it later. I've got a couple suggestions uh, for what that is. Workflowy is my favorite. It's bullets, but nested infinitely. That's all it is. It's, it's the most simple project management software I've, I've found anywhere. It's just bullets all the way down. So it has space for everything. And at this point, I just grab, you know, if I see something that I like or could contribute to something that I want to do later, I just grab it and I throw it in Workflowy and I keep moving on. Um, so if, if you don't uh, say yes to the things you need to say yes to, say no to the things that you should say no to, and say not yet to the thing, to anything else. By the way, I have a hard truth that I want to bring to your attention. There's really, I don't think, no such thing as multitasking. And I think the research bears this out. So on the left is a 2001 study by the American Psychological Association, which says that while doing two tasks at once, like watching a show and writing a paper, your, your effectiveness at both goes down by as much as 40%. On the right is research from the... Uh, Psychology Bulletin Review in 2010 that uh, talked about people who are actually able to multitask and do it well. And their conclusion was that it was about 2% of the population. Maybe you can beat those odds. Maybe you're one of the 2%, 2 but if you're like me, maybe you need to just be honest with yourself and say you're not multitasking, you're switching back and forth between one task and another. Maybe it's time to focus on one thing at a time. This can be very difficult to do, however, so especially if you have a, a part of your creative process that has anything to do with a digital component. So I want to show you a few things to help you because you need all the help that you can get. Attention is a valuable commodity for which technology companies are willing to pay handsomely. And part of my master's degree or part of the master's degree that I have been pursuing is sophisticated business analytics and behavior marketing that are deployed against you to get you to do things that they want you to do. So I want you to have a few tools to, a few strategies and tools to curate your digital experience. First of all, log out of distracting websites. If it's very easy for you to go to Facebook, log out before you close the tab. It adds another step before you're able to get back into that place that doesn't contribute to your goal. It's another gate between the poacher and you. Um, and I found that very helpful. Did you know you can use airplane mode on your phone when you weren't on a plane? They just let you use it whenever. I think that's really helpful. <laughs> um, it helps you work in a distraction-free zone with a click of a button. You decide when you're available uh, and when you're not. And it's very it's one button to do that. Um, I found it helpful to keep as few things on my screen as possible, like browser tabs or, or windows that I have open. And yes, I have two monitors. Um, sometimes I turn off the second one because there's just too much to look at. And even that is too much task switching for me sometimes. If you have to, Downgrade to a simpler machine. 
So George R. R. Martin, the author of A Song of Ice and Fire, which you might know better as Game of Thrones, often uses a DOS word, presser, word processor to do his writing. Thing, it shows one line at a time in green text on a black background, and it's not even capable of connecting to the internet. But it's really, but at his level, like that's what it takes for him, um, and he's willing to do that. Uh, if you do use other media to help you focus, uh, like music or background noise, try to interact with it as little as possible. Pick long playlists, long YouTube videos. Um, and try to block ads if you can. So it's not pulling your attention away as you switch. Um, Brave has a built-in ad blocker that I have, the browser Brave has a built-in ad blocker that I've found, blocks the ads on Spotify. And I don't mind telling you that because I know how much Spotify ads contribute to the to the individual artists. And I think it's safe, I think it's safe to say. Um, and it's also had, and it's also had a, a positive impact on how much time I spend clicking through my Spotify playlists. Um, I, I can't start till I get the perfect song. Just, 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 just don't <laughs> help yourself out. Uh, you might need to make this automatic. And here's a few browser extensions that you can use to do that. These are all on the list that I gave you as well uh, with links if you want to click them. But these are my favorites. Um, Unhook blocks recommended videos, comments, and more from YouTube. And frankly, this one gave me my life back. It's a huge deal works on Chrome, most of these, pretty much all of these work on Chrome, Firefox, and Edge, uh, maybe Opera and Safari, I'm not sure. Um, this is another one of my favorites. This sets time limits on specific sites, so I can be on Facebook, but only for a certain amount of time. Um, you may have heard of the Pomodoro uh, method, where you take 20 minutes on, five minutes off, which is a great, uh, a great way of doing that, but you need to set up a little, you need to set up something to make that easy, so it's not like um, managing your time becomes more of a, a uh, a block than a help. This is a, this is a bookmark manager called Toby. Makes an excellent parking lot. Um, if you have a tendency to throw things in a bookmarks full in your books bookmarks folder and forget where they are and never be able to find them again, Toby's going to help you out. Um, and this is Reader View. This strips a website down just to the just to the text. Um, and yeah, just to the text. And uh, it, it can cut the amount of stuff that you have to wade through by over half, uh, and it can be really helpful. Okay, we are three steps in, and this, these last, I know, it's crazy. <laughs> it, is, uh, it, is, it is absolute sorcery. And yeah, I mean, there, people are out there creating bots and robots to take your attention. Use these tools to take it back. It's your brain. It's your, they're your eyeballs. Um, fight the power or whatever. Uh, thirdly, now that you've created a habitat and now that you're willing to protect it and you have the tools to do that, push the snowball. Uh, I grew up in Northern Illinois. At that latitude, we get snow a lot. Uh, here in Ohio, we get it, I think, once or twice a year. But I made a lot of snowmen when I was a kid. And the way you build a snowman is you start with a very small ball and you push it around and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you go. Um, I think that the best way to work within a creative habitat is to set incremental goals and build on your successes. So here's a few specific ways to do that. Um, first of all, embrace radical incrementalism. Create less, but more often. Uh, Heather, this might actually be an asset for you. Um, it, if you are feeling as though uh, an eight-hour workday is exactly what you need uh, to get to finally succeed in your creative goal, um, think about what you could do with 30 minutes if you had it. It's much, much easier to find. Uh, but see if you can get those 30 minutes more consistently. Um, Oliver Berkman reported in his book, 4,000 Weeks, that uh, the psychology professor Robert Boyce spent his career studying the writing habits of his fellow academics, reaching the conclusion that the most productive and successful among them generally made writing a smaller part of their daily routine than the others, so that it was much more feasible to keep going with it day after day. In my experience, anything that you do three times a week is a lifestyle. That's when exercise starts to have an impact on, on my body. Um, that's when caffeine starts to have an impact on my attention. Uh, and twice a week is 80% as good as three times a week, at least according to the exercise poster I read on the wall of my college gym for four years. 
uh, if you can do an hour over an hour over each of three days, it is way better than three hours on one day. It's just it's just going to work. And I, I think I think this is going to work hugely in your advantage if you can keep track of it. Um, by the way, speaking of keeping track of it, the tracked number grows. The way that you value consistency over intensity is being able to show yourself your successes over time. I've got a couple ways to do this. One is this little number. Um, uh, I just built this uh, table in Word, and uh, I filled in like the couple of things that I want to be doing on this week, and which is my most important thing. And then I could just fill in those boxes and say, um, you know, I did it on this day. And then I can look back and say, wow, I did four days. So even if I was only able to put ten minutes into it on a given day, I did it four times. And in the long run, that is way more powerful. If you're a tech guy or gal, uh, or non-binary pal, you might want to uh, use this app. It's called Habit Share. It basically does the same thing, um, but it helps you, uh, it gives you analytics, and it also helps you connect with friends for a scary accountability, which is the only kind of accountability that works. Um, so I highly recommend it. It's free. It'll change your life. Um, so also in terms of incremental progress, what this means is that you have to be willing to be bored. This is Martin Molin. He's a, a Swedish musician and engineer. He has a band called Wintergotten and a massively successful viral video on YouTube uh, in which he made a machine that ma played music entirely with marbles. Building that machine was largely a matter of cutting gears out on a bandsaw, which takes forever. Um, it may not necessarily be a great way to spend your time. Um, and it was certainly difficult to do. It's boring. Uh, but that's that's partly what success looks like. I think the successful people are the people who are willing to be bored. Oliver Berkman would go on to tell The Guardian in 2020 that the capacity to tolerate minor discomfort is a superpower. And eventually, doing the same banal thing over and over again in service of a larger goal creates this really valuable creative state called flow. Um, and that's where time just flies by and stuff gets done. So you have to be willing to be bored in order to be creatively successful. I think you should also be willing to be derivative. We talked about the Helsinki bus station metaphor. The person who originated it said that you have to wait for the months and years to pass, and soon your differences to begin to appear when, you're a real, when your originality will become visible and you will be able to move past the things that you were doing at the beginning of the year. It takes time. Be willing to be derivative at first. Be kind to yourself. Sure, it looks like everything else that everybody else is making, but that's kind of how, that's because that's what happens when you start making this thing. Give yourself permission to be derivative. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, be willing to suck at this. Sucking at something is the first step to being sort of good at something. I can't tell you the number of times I've picked up the Irish penny whistle and then not learned to play the Irish penny whistle because it is so difficult to it's sucking at the penny whistle is re, it's really bad uh, but you have to get over that hump and you have to give yourself permission to suck at it i think that's that's true of whatever your definition of success is and whatever creative goal you have and whatever habitat you're working in um you're gonna be bad at bad at it when you start it's okay embrace it lastly um we're coming close to time and i want to leave time for questions if there are any um so step four is recycle Past projects become the loam in which future projects grow. And I want you to make the most of what you've created in each project and move forward in new ones. Uh, reading a lot about extinction has introduced me to the concept of a background extinction rate, the, the rate at which we expect things to go extinct. Um, it just happens since ecosystems change over time. So uh, there are pro you are going to start far more projects than you finish. Um, you are going to, uh, you're not going to achieve your definition of success with all of your creative projects. And I think that's okay. If I can be brutally honest and vulnerable with you, um, I've pursued all of these in a meaningful, uh, in a meaningful way. I've poured money and time into all of these different career paths. And I wish I had stayed on the bus for more of them, but my saving grace has been that, uh, I'm able to recycle things from these and move forward. I'll take just a few minutes to tell you one story in particular. This is what happened to 5% Savvy. 
So these are my friends, Luke and Seth. We met Luke earlier. In 2018, I challenged them to join me in February Album Writing Month. It's a lot like NaNoWriMo, if you've heard of that, National Novel Writing Month. Um, but this one is the challenge to write a whole album in uh, 14 songs in 28 days. Same kind of creative sprint, just don't worry about how good it is, get it out there. So I said, hey guys, we're doing it. We're starting a band, we're doing it. Um, between the four of us, we wrote four songs in the whole month, uh, which was enough. It was a quorum. It was enough for an EP. So we booked some studio time. Um, we record. We got an audio engineer. There's him in the back. Uh, we recorded all four of them. Uh, we called it minimum wage. We made an EP out of it. We shot a music video in my very loud Impala. Uh, we got a Twitter handle. It was very cool. I was pitching festivals and bars and coffee shops. I was looking for gigs. We were going to make a go of this. And that summer, Seth moved away. And he wasn't able to come back for a fall or fall 2018 or summer 2019 tour. Um, by the time he got back in fall of 2019, we were out of practice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you absolutely would be able to find the video on YouTube. Uh, it's called 80 to 85. Um, I don't want to, uh, maybe I could, well, uh, actually, I can show you where to find it. Um, that's here. Um, I, we were pretty proud of it. Uh, but, you know, we just, and then and then it rolled into 2020 and even really good bands were having trouble being bands. And that project just ended. Um, I don't know that 5% savvy is ever going to be a thing. Um, so I closed it. And, uh, you know, I told, I told everybody who was involved that, you know, we're not going to move forward. Uh, this is what you can do now. Um, this is what we're doing next. But all of the assets from this project came back. So all of the photos and the videos that we took are all over the background of other, you know, other things that I'm doing my website and social media platforms. I learned vector graphics uh, for this album cover, and that really helped me grow as a graphic designer and a digital marketer. The opening number from this album went into the trailer for my podcast, Making a Monster. And you can still listen to the whole thing at uh, Scintilla Studio slash F, Scintilla.studio slash FPS. We're still proud of it. We liked it. So we put it up there. Um, I created an email sequence that shared all of the songwriting advice I was reading during the project and uh, just gave that out to people. Um, and Seth and Luke and I are all still friends. We play D&D every week and we're still proud of what we did. That I think is the project I have closed most gracefully. And when you're able to do that, you're able to kind of pull things forward and make them, uh, make them work for you in other things. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, I appreciate it. Um, so if, uh, if this is one of like 21 things that I've been doing that didn't work out, how do I move this? How do I keep this from being another bus that has stolen some years of my life? Um, first of all, I kept everything that I used, all of the friendships and all of the assets that I made have continued to contribute to me. So have some grace for yourself. Um, look for other, in the same way that you have defined success, look for other definitions of failure, uh, and move past them if you can. Uh, Secondly, I want to give you uh, I want to give you some of the most freeing advice I got on the subject, which came from David Epstein's book Range. Uh, he suggested that the most successful professionals are those who are able to use what he called lateral thinking. Um, these are people who have a breadth of experience and a depth of expertise. Sure, you'd want to do so many you are you want to do so many more things than you could possibly become a master at. Uh, I think that's just part of living in the world and loving things. Uh, and I don't want to take, I want you to embrace that. I want you to, I want you to feel that joy. Um, but I want you also to know that eventually you need to drill down on something. Um, picks, and if you can find something in all of these other projects that you've used and kind of drill down into the thing that you really want to do, eventually you're going to become um, the kind of professional that David Epstein considers to be the most successful. It's a great book. I recommend you read it. Um, it's very helpful. Um, evaluate closed projects compassionately. Um, so find the common elements between what you've tried and what you want and figure out a way to bring your audience with you, which is in fact what I would suggest you do if you're looking at, uh, which is, uh, I think that's my, my suggestion for step four, is to make a list of the things that you've pursued, whether they are as careers, hobbies, or happy accidents, figure out what they all have in common. And what have you made or learned that you can use in other projects? Um, that's it. Those are the four steps for creative success, how to, how to build a thriving creative ecosystem 
in four particular ways. It's not a magic bullet. Uh, it's not about overnight. It's not a key to success. What I think it is, is a, is a blueprint for sustainability. Um, and if you have a sustainable creative lifestyle, then success follows. And I do want that for you. So briefly, I want, I want to show you um, what we've talked about. Build a habitat, decide on a single goal, figure out what your species is, move forward. Keep out poachers. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Say yes to some things, say no to some things, say not yet to some other things. Push the snowball. Value consistency over intensity. Um, success takes time, and there's a lot of terrible art to be made before you ever make good art. Finally, recycle. Embrace the breadth of your expertise or, or of your experience. Pursue a depth of expertise. Close projects gracefully. Make the most of projects when they close. Um, before we close, I, I just want to say that uh, this takes a lot of energy, <laughs> and um, I don't have I don't have the energy for it every day. Uh, but there are there are certain sources of energy that I think or creative energy or, or chutzpah or whatever you want to call it that work a lot better. Um, this is uh, this is a comic from a gentleman by the name of Gavin Ong Thon, uh, and he dramatized a quote from author John Green. Which should be a familiar name to people, right? Uh, the Fault in Our Stars. Um, the man I, I read. A, I read all of John Green's novels in one summer because they're very short, and I was keeping track of how many books I read that year. So I went through all of them. Um, but uh, this is from a Vlogbrothers video back in two thousand and nine, uh, and this is what he said: Every single day, I get emails from aspiring writers asking my advice on how to become a writer. creative goals. And here's the only advice I can give. Don't make stuff because you want to make money. It will never make you enough money. Don't make stuff because you want to get famous. You will never feel famous enough. Make gifts for people. And work hard on making those gifts in the hope that those people will notice. Maybe they will notice how hard you worked and maybe they won't. And if they don't notice, I know it's frustrating. But ultimately, that doesn't change anything because your responsibility is not to the people you're making the gift for, but to the gift itself. My hope for you as a creator, whatever kind of creator you are, is that you will fill the world with your gifts. I wish for your mind to be your own, for your space and your habitat to be your own, for you to make choices about how you use it and be the author of those choices. I wish for you to succeed on your terms, to know what your success means for you uh, and to pursue it wholeheartedly. I want for you never to fail because you didn't try. Uh, I want you to fail for, for the right reasons because you tried and you failed. And I want you to see failure as an opportunity. Uh, this is, <laughs> failure is how things happen. Um, it's not, you're, it's not, uh, you're not burning trees, you're laying down loam. Uh, and that I think is what a good ecosystem looks like. So if I have, uh, if I have earned your follow, or if you'd like to he uh, hear more about where I come from and what I'm doing, um, this is where you can find me. Uh, on the web, you can go to scintilla.studio slash FPS if you want to check out the, the EP I put together in 2018, slash monster if you want to check out my podcast, Making a Monster, or you can get it wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple, whatever. Um, and check out, uh, connect with me on Twitter. That's where I spend most of my time online. Uh, uh, go to twitter.com slash spark otter. I'd love to hear from you about the things that you're making and how they contribute and what a uh, creative ecosystem means to you. And while you're there, check out hashtag book of extinction. That is how I'm gathering all of the work or all of the behind the scenes stuff that's going into this massive project, uh, immortalizing extinct animals for Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and if that sounds like something you're interested in, you can get the first three of those monsters for free right now. Everything we earn from that preview is going to support the work of the Center for Biological Diversity uh, and their legal and advocacy work to protect endangered species in wild, wild places in the U.S. and abroad. Um, 
this is the this is my most important thing. This is the thing that I'm running at as hard as I can um because I think it's going to give something to the world. And uh I hope that just by by seeing how this works, you can you can make something as incredibly powerful and lovely as anything that I could have made. So thank you for being here. I'll open it up for questions. We've got uh, we've got a few minutes um and I'll I'll be the last one off the call. So uh <laughs> if you want to stick around past 3:30 that's fine with me. Thank you so much, Lucas. Let's see. We have any questions? <laughs> How did Write Library snag you for this? Um, I uh, they one of the Write at Write series with was oh I I should remember her name. It would be much kinder of me if I did. Um, she was uh, she was doing a talk on how to write for games uh, and how to and that was exactly what I wanted to do at the time, and I said, hey, uh, I've got a similar thought. What <laughs> what would you uh, what would you like? So I, I I pitched them and they were kind enough to uh, to bring me on. It's a huge vote of confidence. Uh, yes, I believe Elizabeth is the one who you spoke to. Yep, she is the. Uh, uh, supervisor for the adult services at Wright Library. Thanks, Peggy. I try to. Thanks, Jennifer. That's my mom. Thanks for being here, mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Mary. Um, and uh, thank you, Mary, for the nice comment about the maker, the maker boxes here at Wright Library. Um, that sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie asks, how do you find ways to still be creative when you don't feel inspiration? Uh, I think the whole point of having a successful creative ecosystem is to be able to, is that inspiration isn't the, isn't the driving force of it. Um, uh, I try to figure out what makes me most inspired. And I try to try to put myself in that situation. So it's about, um, you know, what uh, am I sleeping enough? Am I, <laughs> am I getting the right? Am I getting not too much caffeine at the right time? Uh, you know, what are what are the the things that I find inspiring? And I try to be there. Uh, I think of inspiration like a spark, and I don't. This it's not very predictable for me. Um, so I try to try to figure out a way of living that kind of grabs onto it. That's not a very good answer for how do you create without inspiration. I guess my answer is just that I try not to try not to need it. Um, if you're familiar with OK Go, this it's a band that makes viral music videos. They did the one on um, uh, treadmills a while back. Uh, creative goal I've been talking about, I think. Uh, if that answers your question, Julie. Yeah, it is about making creativity habitual. Um, OK Go comes up with these bonkers, uh, really wild conceptual viral music videos, or they did for a while. And the way they talked about it was not having a fully formed idea when you get to the place, but in creating a sandbox in which ideas happen. Um, so uh, we're going to get a warehouse and we're going to play with optical illusions uh, and we're going to do we're going to dance, but on a moving surface. Um, and that's that's kind of how they make ideas, um, you know, just by putting themselves in a situation where ideas can happen. And I really appreciated that. Uh, there's a great TED talk by them about it. Hey, another Illinois native. Yeah, it does things to you that those those fields. Uh, yes, as a person who did grow up in the country, uh, <laughs> I had, my sister was much older than me and didn't like to uh, hang out and I had nobody around me that was my age. You learn to uh, use your imagination to uh, keep yourself occupied, especially in the 80s before they had, <laughs> before they had internet and things like that. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, thank you again, Lucas. We really appreciate the time. Oh, oh yeah. I've got one more question here. Sarah asks, how do you stick with a project when you lose steam? Um, I think it's, uh, I have to fall back on a very similar answer. Uh, first of all, don't force it. Uh, <laughs> like just go to bed. Um, <laughs> Part of the part of the beauty of having a creative ecosystem and valuing consistency over intensity is that you give yourself permission that it's not going to happen today um, for a variety of very good reasons. But if you've set up your life such that it can happen again later, then it takes a lot of the pressure off. Um, I think that's the best answer I can give without knowing exactly which project and exactly which steam. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's the best answer. Um, also, you know, maybe it's a predator as well. Like maybe it's, maybe it, the deadline is tomorrow and you just have to. Um, never underestimate the value of just have to, of, I just have to, you know? <laughs> it's great to see such an interactive, uh audience so <laughs> well yeah thank you guys for all of your questions all of your energy i didn't think i would be talking for an hour and a half straight um but it turns out when you spend 10 years figuring something out you uh you have a lot of thoughts about it uh, so i really appreciate your attention thank you for spending your sunday afternoon with me it's been a joy thank you again and uh as I said, we got some more uh, events going to be coming up next year. So keep an eye out. We have a, a page that's, if you go to the page that has uh, about the information for today's, you can follow that link to the right to right. And uh, there's a lot more stuff ready to go for next year. Thank you so much again, Lucas. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Let's see, here we go.